In this video, I'm going to give an overview of version control. I'll discuss version control within Houdini when saving digital assets, as well as give an explanation of version control software. There are lots of different options when it comes to version control software. The video aims to give a general overview of how we use version control, rather than a recommendation of any particular software or how to set up version control. That said, I felt it was important to touch upon the subject, as it's such an essential part of game development and team collaboration. If you aren't familiar with the concept of version control, version control software tracks every change made to a project and records the change into a database. The user can then choose to undo those changes or commit them to a repository which is stored on a remote server. When collaborating with a team, users can pull changes made by other team members from the remote server to update their local copy of the project, as well as commit changes of their own. Version control software also allows users to create branches which split off from the main project. Users can then make independent changes and choose which changes they wish to merge back into the main branch. We've been using Unity version control, previously known as Plastic SCM. As I said, this isn't a particular recommendation of any particular uh, version control software, as there's plenty of other options out there to, to choose from. This was more chosen as a, a matter of convenience, but that said, it suited our needs. Within Houdini itself, there was also functionality to save and iterate versions of digital asset, although we didn't use it to a great extent with Project Pegasus, as we were able to use version control software to track the changes that we made to the digital assets. On a longer project and with a larger team, there is perhaps a place to use both. For example, if you're making significant changes to a digital asset that alters its functionality, then it might be helpful to maintain multiple versions of digital assets for users to switch between. So I'm going to demonstrate that now. I'm currently in Houdini 20 and I'm going to create and save a digital asset. I'm just going to add a null, place it into a subnet, right click on the subnet and come down to create digital asset. This is the new interface for saving digital assets in Houdini 20. You might be familiar with Houdini 19.5 and in which case the process is much the same. On the left I have the uh, interface for saving digital assets in Houdini 20 and on the right, the interface in Houdini 19.5. And you can see in both, we can specify the asset name, we can specify an author, as well as a version. And then we can place the digital asset under a submenu as well. And here we have the internal name of the digital asset. And then the bottom here to find the path to which the digital asset is saved. So I just wanted to compare the two uh, user interfaces, just so if you're using a version prior to Houdini 20, you can also follow along. So first of all, we want to give the digital asset a name. I'm going to call it PE Digital Asset Example. For Project Pegasus, we decided to prefix our digital assets with this project code, PE, so that it's easy to search for and find all of the digital assets. And I'm going to place it under a submenu called Pegasus. And here we have the internal name of the digital asset. We can see there are different sections in different colours in this internal name. And these different sections are called namespaces. And the namespaces are separated by these colons. And this is an internal ID. And the different namespaces are used to identify the digital asset's name its author, as well as its version number. You can uncheck these options if you don't want to include these namespaces, and you would just have the base name of the digital asset. I'm going to leave the author name checked, as well as the version name. There's also an option to add a branch namespace. This may be useful if you have a larger team, or you have some digital assets which are still in development, as well as some that are ready to be released to the wider team. Digital assets that are in development can be placed on the development branch, whereas digital assets that can be used by the wider team and ready to be released can be placed on a branch called main. This way users can swap between versions that are in development and the more stable releases that might be on the main branch. I'm going to leave the branch namespace unchecked. I want to change the location of where this digital asset is being saved to and place the path with the Pegasus demo variable 
that I set up in the previous video. And we can see here the file name of this digital asset. It is currently prefixed SOP because this is a digital asset at the surface level. It is a surface operator. If I was to convert this node to a digital asset, which is at the object level, then it would be prefixed with OBJ for object. If you don't want it to be prefixed by this category type, you can uncheck this option here. We then have the author name, my name, followed by the name of the digital asset and the version number. And I'm going to hit create. And then I'm going to hit accept on the type properties window. And come down and hit match current definition. So now we have our digital asset saved to disk in our project folder structure. Now let's say I want to make some changes to this digital asset. I'm going to right click on the digital asset, come down to digital asset and click increase minor version. This has brought up the new digital asset menu and we can see it's increased the version number from 1.0 to 1.1. And we can see that 1.1 version number namespace is updated as well as increasing the version number on the digital asset file. So I'm going to hit create. That's going to launch the type properties window again and I can begin to make some changes. So I'm going to delete this null and add a cube. And I'm going to add some parameters to my digital asset. And come back up to our digital asset. We can see I've got those parameters added. So I'm going to right click and click save node type to change those changes. And I can match the current definition to lock the digital asset. And if I take a look at the OTLS folder, we can see now I have version 1.0 and version 1.1, my new version with the added cube. Now I might want to make some significant changes and changes from a cube to say a sphere. So I'm going to right click, digital asset, and this time I'm going to increase the major version number. So currently it's going to increase it from 1.1 to 2.1. I actually want to increase it to 2.0, so I'm going to amend this from 2.1 to 2.0. And you can see that's updated it in the file name as well. So we can hit create. And again, it's launched the type properties window, and I can make my changes to version 2 of the digital asset. So I'm going to delete the cube, and I'm going to add a sphere. I'll delete these old parameters for the cube, and add the parameters for the sphere. And hit accept. Again, I'm just going to save node type to save the changes to version 2 of the digital asset and click match current definition. So now rather than a cube, we have a sphere. But there may be some users that want to continue to use version 1.1 of the digital asset because they wanted to use the cube. So we can swap between versions of a digital asset by coming up to the assets menu, coming to asset definition toolbar and click show menu always. And now I have this bar here at the top of my digital asset. And if I click on this first drop down menu, I can see version 2, 1.1, and version 1.0 of the digital asset. So if I select 1.1, I have the version with the cube, as well as version 1.0 that had just the null inside. So this way, users can switch between different versions of a digital asset. On the right here, we also have a path. So you may have um, multiple versions of a digital asset stored in different packages in different locations. So you can also swap between those versions here as well. So that's a look at creating and managing versions within, within Houdini. As I said, because we used version control software, in general, we were able to use this software to track the changes to digital assets. So if we made any changes to digital assets, we can use the version control to roll back to previous versions of digital assets and reverse those changes. There may be a use case for using both types of version control within a project. Hopefully this has given you some of the idea of how we use version control on Project Pegasus, either managing versions of digital assets from within Houdini, or gives you more understanding of the role of version control software across a large project.